Hello and welcome to another episode of Weapons and Warfare from Straight Arrow News. I'm your host, Ryan Robertson, and we are coming to you from National Harbor, Maryland, about 10 miles south of D.C. We are here for the Navy League's Sea Airspace 2024 Expo. It's the largest maritime exhibition of its kind in North America. Over the next few days, we'll be gathering stories to share with you over the coming weeks as we take a look at what the future looks like for the Navy and Marine Corps. But first, some headlines you may have missed. About 50 miles northeast of here, the cleanup and recovery continues at the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Shortly after the collapse, the U.S. Navy announced it had sent several pieces of specialized equipment, including a 1,000-ton lift capacity derrick barge and a 200-ton lift capacity revolving crane barge. The two barges are being used by the Navy's supervisor of salvage and diving to remove submerged portions of the key bridge. The first MQ-4C Triton arrived at Naval Air Station Siganella. The Triton is a high-altitude, long-endurance, unmanned aerial vehicle, and it's the Navy's newest surveillance and reconnaissance patrol asset. The Navy has yet to announce how many Tritons it plans to send to the base off the Italian coast. NAS Siganella, which is on the island of Sicily, plays an important role within NATO, as its strategic location helps the U.S. and its partners maintain security and stability in Europe, Africa, and Central Command's area of responsibility. And for the first time, Marines are deployed with their new amphibious combat vehicles. The U.S. Naval Institute is reporting the USS Boxer recently left San Diego for a delayed deployment with the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit. Training issues led to the delay after multiple ACVs were knocked over during drills on a beach in California. Apparently, they're a little top-heavy. The Boxer will ultimately end up in Thailand to take part in the Cobra Gold training exercise. One of the things that you really start to gain appreciation for when you come to an event like Sea Air Space 2024 is really just the wide cross-section of America that's represented by our men and women in uniform. Folks that have skills that go well beyond their military training, like the subject of this week's debrief. Meatball, line up, AOA. Meatball, line up, AOA. Ball, ball, ball. I'm not so sure about this one. Uh, huh. We're good. That's a clip from a video called Best Arrested Landing Narration. Dot, dot, dot. Ever? Question mark? And it's from the Fly Rob Roy YouTube channel, a place that offers viewers an inside look at life as a naval aviator. The video prompted us to want to know more about Rob Roy, the content creator, so I sat down with him for a virtual interview to hear more of his story. All right, Lieutenant Rob Roy, uh, formerly with the U.S. Navy, thank you so much for joining us uh, for, for this conversation on weapons and warfare. Um, really just want to kind of to dive right in. Uh, I mean, you are a lieutenant in the Navy. You, you flew, uh, pr you know, propeller planes. How did you how did you get into it? Where did you start? Awesome. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Yeah, I was lieutenant in the United States Navy. Uh, I got out about two years ago. Uh, I got commissioned at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland in 2001, and then I went to flight school shortly thereafter, Pensacola, Corpus Christi, Texas, Meridian, Mississippi, back to Corpus, and then ultimately started flying uh, the mighty C-2 Greyhound uh, out of Norfolk, Virginia uh, in the mid-2010s with VRC-40, my squadron. And for folks who don't know, the C-2 Greyhound, it's one of, what, two propeller planes that can land on aircraft carriers? Yeah, the E-2 Hawkeye. It's got the big dome on top, so if people have seen the recent Top Gun Maverick movie, there's a two and a half second shot of a Hawkeye, you know, controlling uh, the aircraft, basically. We are a version of that, take away the dome, same propeller, same cockpit, basically, but a lot fatter of a body of an aircraft and take away all the officers in the back and replace them with 30 souls. So a couple air crew and a lot of passengers or 10,000 pounds of cargo or a combination of the two. So we were the the cod for the, uh, the air wing, the carrier onboard delivery. So we brought all the mail, cargo, people, distinguished visitors, supplies, engine we parts. Uber for the Navy. We were literally Uber for the Navy and Amazon Prime basically delivers for the Navy. I had an Amazon Prime patch 30 years ago. They had a USPS postal service patch. So, and I would bring on like pizzas and shawarmas and some people would get tuxedos and suits at the, uh, the local markets overseas. And like they would go there on their, you know, their Liberty call. And three weeks later, we'd like pick up all their orders and bring out huge boxes of custom-made suits and, and whatnot to the, to the air wing. Yeah. It's a good time. 
when did you, you have a YouTube channel and it's, you know, it, you started it obviously when you got out of the service. Is that right? I started it in fall of 2020 because like everyone else, I was kind of bored and COVID. <laughs> Here we go. Flying a cargo plane full of rubber dog shit. never gets old. Woo. One more time. So I uploaded these videos uh, in the fall of 2020 or a couple of them. I knew that they would pop with like 10,000, maybe a hundred thousand views. No idea. No idea they would get millions of views uh, a few weeks or months later. Um, because when I recorded it, it was for my wife and my mom, basically I put on Facebook at like, you know, a thousand views, whatever. And I didn't record it for the whole point of YouTube. I mean, if I could do it over again today, knowing what I know about building a brand and, and even telling the Navy story, it'd be like, Hey guys, you know, let's follow me out to the, we're going to go. Right. I didn't know that. Right. I just, I just, you're so focused on the mission. It was a lot of during pre-flight, you know, certainly before I did the first couple, it was really testing like, will these work? Are these GoPro grips going to hold kind of thing? Once all that was dialed in, it was like, you know, cause I'm not trying to be a nuisance to my co-pilot, to the air crew, to the mission. So yeah, like you, have, you get in, yeah, there's more important things to play than yeah, you right? <laughs> and then you're like, okay, I'm, I'm focusing on the, on the carrier landing on the boat. And then we're okay. We're about 10 minutes from landing. Boop, boop. And you're done. Like you don't think about it anymore. Then I just, I'm, if you watch the videos, I completely focus on the task at hand. I kind of forget there's even a GoPro there. Maybe one or two. I'm getting ready to take a catapult shot. I kind of look at it because we're just literally waiting to, to get launched at that point. But yeah, that's that's how I want started. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for staying focused on mission and uh, keeping me too. That's a secondary. Oh yeah. Uh, but but also thank you for for launching this because it you give people an insight into something that, you know, we don't see on an everyday basis and you right. have a good personality and you add some humor to it. So yeah. Uh, from, from your audience perspective, I understand why it popped. Um, Appreciate that. Yeah, you bet. So when the, when the idea came to, to do like, Hey, you know, these videos are doing pretty well. I'm going to start leaning into it. Like, obviously you've gained some notoriety within the world of, of, you know, YouTube streamers and all that kind of thing. What's kind of been the, the personal impact like you get recognized when you're out and about i've been recognized twice like actually randomly once was at a restaurant in you know washington state and just with during covid with a mask on and everything and yeah. that was kind of very surprising i kept hearing like rob roy maybe i'm like okay i'm not hearing things <laughs> and they were being really nice and then one other time was at oshkosh which just kind of made sense because i was there at the big air show um but no no one nothing too crazy i think the reason is because a lot of my videos, my visor's down. Uh, we didn't wear a mask, like all the Hornet guys. I can't even see who they are, but the visor's down. You can't hear me talking because, again, I recorded it in 2015. I didn't really, I wanted to record the audio, but I just couldn't at the time between Amazon and, you know, BH photo and video, like whatever. I couldn't find the adapter for the very specific Navy plugs. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think as my channel grows and pivots, I'm kind of moving into more of a general aviation direction the next couple of weeks and months. I think it will definitely get more you know, exposure with my face and my voice. But uh, at the time, you know, a lot of my Navy buddies have reached out and just you know said they like what I'm doing and, you know, represent the Navy in a good light. I think it's just about all the, the questions that I had for you today. Um, really appreciate your time, uh, L Lieutenant Rob Roy. Uh, and we talked about this before we hit recording, but your namesake is awesome and for yeah. folks who are not fans of history you should look up rob roy not just the movie that liam neeson was in but also the character from from history the, the man yep. from history who yep. rob roy is right yeah great guy yeah no relation unfortunately to the mcgregor clan i wish that it was but i pay a lot of respect to rob roy um and i feel like if, the, if any mcgregors in scotland are listening want to give me a free pass to a clan meeting i'd love to join up because uh i have a lot of uh you know <laughs> A lot of uh, feelings in my heart uh, because my whole life just you know been associated with, with him and whatnot. Some people, some people think it's a call sign, but no, it's my real name. And if you want to check out Rob's stuff and you'd be happy you did, here is where you can find him in all of the creator spaces. All right, folks, for our Weapon of the Week segment, we're going to stay with carrier-based operations and tell you about a new toy that the U.S. Navy might be playing with very soon. Meet the MQ-25 Stingray, a new aerial tanker. It's sleek, can carry a lot of gas, and it's unmanned. This is what the Navy hopes will help carrier air wings and carrier strike groups maximize their air power. Built by Boeing, the MQ-25 is the result of years of engineering and testing. The project was announced in April of 2018. Boeing released a video at the time. As you can tell, what was imagined and what was eventually built are two fairly similar looking aircraft. 
Less than four years later, the real version of the Stingray headed to sea for its first test aboard an aircraft carrier. We're calling this the Unmanned Carrier Aviation Demonstration to look at how the MQ operates on the flight deck, both for propulsion testing and our human factors evaluation. This is a historic moment for the Navy and for the Boeing Company because this is the first evaluation that we're making of this vehicle's ability to operate with the fleet. Those tests must have gone reasonably well because in February, Boeing handed over the first Stingray to the Navy for evaluation. More than just being a flying fuel can for the Navy's F-18s and F-35s, the MQ-25 is also expected to play a role in gathering intelligence, as well as conducting surveillance and reconnaissance missions. For the right to build the Stingray, Boeing beat out General Atomics and Lockheed Martin for an $805 million contract. Providing all goes well, the Navy's deal includes four more Stingrays for the fleet, with plans to equip all Nimitz and Ford-class carriers with the ability to operate MQ-25s. All right, folks, it's time now for comms check. Like you know, it's one of my favorite parts of the show because it's our opportunity to kind of see where you are as the viewers and gauge your questions, um, answer those, and kind of give you updates to stories that we have reported on previously. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first comms check this week comes to us on a story that we had done on Russia upgrading its production of 500, 1500, and 3000 kilogram FAB bombs. These are the glide bombs that Russia is using to devastating effect right now in Ukraine. So from that story, Lance Farmer wants to know, what happened to these crippling sanctions? Well, it's a good question, Lance. Yes, the United States and the West did put some sanctions on Russia to kind of try to stop Moscow from being able to to operate as a normal country and, and kind of uh, help him in, if you will, some of uh, Russia's capabilities to produce and make weaponry. But those sanctions aren't 100%. Not, not all of those sanctions stop everything. There have been multiple weapons and munit munitions found on the battlefield in Ukraine that have parts from Western nations, countries that are supposed to have bans in place to stop their supplies from going into Russia. However, Russia is a big country. They are they have spies, right? They have uh, capabilities in place to be able to buy things on the black market and, and have things shipped over into Russia. Um, and these FAB bombs, it's the bombs themselves are older technology, putting the glide wings on them. Uh, that's, that's the new feature. Uh, but the bombs themselves, Russia is able to make those and has been able to make those for some time. And a lot of that stuff they, they produce domestically. So Lance, to answer your question, there are a number of sanctions in place that are that are, you know, yeah, stopping Russia from being able to reconstitute as quickly, but Russia has friends in China, Russia has friends in Iran that are helping them uh, being able to produce these weapons. So, sanctions in place, they're not 100% effective, maybe more sanctions necessary or enforcing the sanctions to a greater extent uh, could, could help slow down Russia's ability to produce these weapons at, at scale. So, hope that answered your question, Lance. Uh, our next comms check is really an update to a story that we did on our very first weapons and warfare about some of the new weaponry uh, that's uh, making its ways into the hands of our warfighters. Back in January, we told you about the Army selecting Sig Sauer and their M7 rifle, as well as the M250 saw as the next generation weapons for their soldiers. Well, now those soldiers are getting their hands on them. With new weapons training scheduled for this month, the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell uh, in Kentucky began equipping soldiers with the new rifles and the XM-157 Fire Control Advanced Optic, plus the 6.8mm family of ammunition. Revolutionary stuff. These new weapons, destined for the hands of the Army's close contact troops, are replacing the M4 and the M249. So Army is, uh, the 104th Airborne, very happy to be getting their hands on some of these new weaponry. Uh, you know, I wish I could have one, but you know, maybe someday. But in the meantime, folks, that'll do it for comps check. As always, if you have a question, thought, concern that you want us to address here on the show, you can leave a comment below in the section down below, or you can send us an email, weapons and warfare, all spelled out, weapons and warfare at san.com. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. Okay, folks, time is winding down on this week's episode of Weapons and Warfare. 
But don't worry, just because this episode is almost over doesn't mean we're done reporting on everything that went down here this week at the Navy League's Sea Airspace 2024 Expo in National Harbor, Maryland. On the contrary, we have all sorts of great content coming your way. Super producer Brett Baker was hard at work setting up all sorts of interviews with all sorts of people. So whether it's adaptive engineering, drones, rebuilding our nation's shipbuilding capacity, we have those stories and more coming your way in the weeks slash months ahead. So make sure you stay tuned. But getting back to this week's episode and at the risk of sounding like Captain Obvious, there is a lot of money tied up in defense contracting. I mean, look around this place, right? And there are plenty of people out there who will see the products on the floor here at the Navy League's Sea Air Space 2024 Expo and think, man, what if we use that money somewhere else? Think about how much good we could do. And folks, I understand that sentiment, but before we start criticizing the military for spending way too much money on stuff, I thought it might be a good opportunity to explain some of the other everyday inventions we use in our life that make our lives better that are brought to us by the military. First off, let's start with the way you are watching or listening to me right now, the internet. Much to Al Gore's dismay, he did not invent the WWW. No, the DOD did back in the 1960s. Some other things invented or popularized by the military, computers, GPS, microwaves, cargo pants, and duct tape. In real talk, folks, as a dude who went to college in the early 2000s, I can tell you I would not have survived without microwave ovens and cargo pants, just both so convenient. And when it comes to duct tape, I can tell you that redneck chrome has gotten me out of my fair share of binds from time to time. You can also thank the military for t-shirts, wristwatches, stainless steel, and Jeeps. And if the military is responsible for Jeeps, well, Karen, you can probably thank the military for all of those SUVs and crossovers as well. The point is, yes, we spend a lot of money on national defense, but many of those breakthroughs in science and engineering, which are achieved through military funding, don't stop with the military. We use stuff every single day that started in the military but made its way out into the civilian world. And we would not be the same without them. Just something to ponder. And that's going to do it for this episode of Weapons and Warfare from Straight Arrow News. Like I said, keep it tuned here because we have lots of great content coming to you soon from the Navy League's Sea Airspace 2024 Expo. In the meantime, for senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.